I'm going to go right now to the scriptures and we're going to take our text and we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and let's put this on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and we're going to begin at the 13th verse. We've been talking about this quite a bit in the last few weeks and I'm so excited about how God is continuing to speak to us. So in verse 13, the Bible said, if you look at verse 12, Paul and the rest of the apostles used great plainness of speech. And he says, and not as Moses was, would, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. And from there, I want to take you to 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. Let's just drop down a little bit. So after mentioning Moses' face being veiled, it then talks about us in the new covenant listening to the apostles. But we all, with open face, not veiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Look at those words, beholding the glory. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord were changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, last week, God had showed us that we're entering into the most holy place beyond the veil, and we just read about a veil. And we are changed into His image so that we could become most holy to enter the most holy place. And... That is the whole basis of the gospel, that we're not good enough on our own, and we need Jesus Christ and His holiness. And then in the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of what? The glory of God. There's glory again. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that glory that we're beholding in a glass, that we're changed into, is mentioned here as though God said, let there be light and notice. Spirit's just showing me this now. The word, God said, he spoke a word and said, let there be light, and glory started shining. And here God gives light, but this time it's the form of light that's called the knowledge of the glory of God, and it's found in the face of Jesus Christ. So the glory of God is always found in the face of Jesus Christ, and it's related to the face of Jesus. And there's a deep truth I want to bring out about this that's going to really bless each one of us. How many understand that Jesus said, He's the light of the world? And in John 1 and 1, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So He's light, and He's the Word. And what's so beautiful, and again, I'm just seeing this now. The Spirit's already working with us, folks, and speaking to us some revelation. In the beginning is a reference to Genesis. 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, where it says, God who said, let there be light, and he spoke light, and light came out of darkness. That's all a reference to Genesis. And John and Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 4 both appealed to Genesis to bring out a truth. And that word that was with God and the Word was God in the beginning. That's how God started the work, book of Genesis out. In the beginning, God created. And the first thing He spoke was, let there be light. So He is the Word and He speaks light. And in verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And again, we beheld His glory. Just like in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, beholding His glory in a glass, as in a mirror or a glass. So we beheld his glory, John said, as the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, unveiling is a word that actually means revelation. Unveiling, and you could look carefully, and in the word revelation, you'll see a derivation of the word veil. Reveal, revelation. So when Jesus came into the world as the Word made flesh, His face was associated with an unveiling. 
and a veiling or a revelation. Now, Moses was a foreshadow of Jesus. And that's why 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says that law was an inferior covenant and law would fade away just like the glory on Moses' face would eventually fade away. But even as inferior a glory as it was compared to Jesus, he still had to have a veil on his face. It was so bright. And that veil over the face of Moses represents the old covenant, an inferior covenant. It was a covenant of shadows and foreshadows and symbolism of what Jesus brought. But how many are glad we're in the real thing? We're, we're in a time that's plain teaching. It's plainness of speech. It's not like Moses who put a veil on his face. In other words, the new covenant is the real thing. There's no symbols. There's no foreshadows. Praise God. It's unveiled. We look at Jesus with open face, whereas they looked at Moses with a veiled face. And that represents how everything under the old covenant was a shadow and symbolic of the real thing that Jesus brought, and that's why Jesus' face is unveiled. It's open. Now, I'm going to expand more on this idea of being changed into God's image. The face of Jesus is unveiled, and that's where the glory was. Remember in the Old Covenant, in the temple's holiest of holies, where was the glory? It was on the Ark of the Covenant. And that glory would shine. And let, let me just show you a, a diagram of that. You can see the glory. There was a literal light and glory that shone on the Ark of the Covenant. And there you can see as though it's shining through the veil and indicating that there really was a glory over that ark. You see, the, out, the outer court had the sunshine, the outer court of the tabernacle and the temple. The holy place had the light of the candlesticks, seven lamps, perfect light. But it, still, it was natural light. It was fire. But what's beyond that is in the holiest of holies, the inner sanctum, where there was glory shining light, the glory of God. And the Bible tells us that the glory is now in the face of Jesus Christ. Remember what John, or rather Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and the 6th verse. It talks about light in the form of knowledge, but it's still the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So in John 1 and 14 tells us that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. That is spiritual language. Catch this. This is powerful. That spiritual language that we have knowledge of God's glory. We understand truth. John said, we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten. And then when you read 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, you are changed into that image when you receive glory. And 2 Corinthians 4 and 6 brings it out even more clear that that light is the knowledge. So knowledge is what you learn. And when you receive a revelation, when you learn of the glory of God, and it's in the face of Jesus where you're going to find it, that's all symbolic. It's in the new covenant. You're changed when you get that kind of revelation. And look what the end of verse 14 says. He was full of grace and truth. Isn't the New Testament message in contrast to the old covenant law called grace and truth? Jesus was full of grace. He was full of truth. He said, I am the truth. I am the way, the life, and the truth. And he being full of it, his face shining into our hearts represents our hearts receiving that truth, receiving that grace. If you want to get filled with grace, look to the one who's full of grace. Look to the one who's full of truth and let that change you into his image. Because if it changes you into his image, you're going to be full of grace. You're going to be full of truth. And you're going to be made most holy so that you can get into the most holy place. So to behold his glory 
is spiritual language that speaks about getting a revelation, getting an unveiling of truth. And it's all connected to what was behind the ark of the, or rather, what was behind the veil. Take a look at this. The Ark of the Covenant was behind the veil in the holiest of holies. Now, God said his word would come to Moses from between the cherubims over the mercy seat. God literally spoke right from that point in the Ark of the Covenant beyond the veil. The word of God came forth. And let's show you that in uh, Exodus chapter 25. Let me bring it up. The 25th chapter. I'm always so blessed reading this 25th chapter. You're, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. And he goes on and talks about uh, making the tabernacle out of gold, silver, and brass. And then when you drop down to verse 21, And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark above upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee and there will I meet with thee notice I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony God said I'm going to speak to you my word is going to come from this location past the veil in the holiest of holies hallelujah so if you were in that day when the Ark of the Covenant was in the holiest of holies beyond the veil and the veil was removed, you would have seen the Ark from which God spoke to the people. So an unveiling would show you the place where God speaks. Well, Jesus' face is unveiled and it shows us that the Word who is Jesus, is unveiled, and from his face comes the word, just like from the Ark of the Covenant came the word of God. And it says it changes you into his same image, face to face. You're looking face. It reminds me of Genesis, when the Spirit of God moved on the face of the earth, on the face of the deep. Face to face. And, and there's a deep part of us, which is our human spirits, our hearts. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God, Paul said, shines in our hearts. And he said it changes us into his image. And so the deep, the face of the deep represents your heart, the deep part of you. And when you turn your heart to the Lord, and it's said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 18, uh, before verse 18, that Turning our hearts to the Lord causes a veil to be removed from our hearts. And Jesus is the source of that word. He is behind the veil like the ark was behind the veil. And the glory of the ark was the light of God shining. And Jesus is from his face shining forth truth to our lives. Praise God. And Jesus is God's way of communion. Isn't that powerful to notice that they had the ark and, and only one man could get in there to see that ark, to see that glory one day a year. But Jesus' face is unveiled and it's open for all of us at any given time. You don't even have to be in church. You could be sitting like we are right now studying the word of God and receiving truth into your heart. Praise God. And being changed, getting revelation. You see... It might not be one day a year that we can look at Jesus' face, but a lot of believers do it only one day a week. When every day you can get into the word of the Lord. In fact, the Bible says when you make the Lord's Prayer, give us this day, our daily bread. The word is our daily bread. And you can get revelation from Jesus every day. It's at our disposal 24-7. Hallelujah. Now, we also had preached and taught you in the past how that Hebrews chapters 8 through 9 stated that the veil was part of the holy place where all the activity of the priests took place in their rituals. Remember that? The holy place and the veil represented the old covenant. And let me show you some more. We, we showed you this a few weeks ago. There you've got what the book of Hebrews calls the second tabernacle 
and the first tabernacle. And it gives a message. Let me show you in the book of Hebrews again. Chapter 9. These words. In the sixth verse. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second it would be the second tabernacle, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. And the Holy Ghost was signifying by that kind of order and that kind of way and system that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was yet standing. And so there you've got the first tabernacle, and that's where the priests always went in accomplishing their service. But in that second one, where the holiest of holies was, the Ark of the Covenant, the high priest alone went once every year. And you can see the Ark of the Covenant there. And then we understand that the first covenant, which is represented by the first tabernacle, had to be removed so that you could get into the second tabernacle, which represents the second covenant, the new covenant. And so there you've got both of them together. But then if you remove the first, then all that's left is the holiest of holies. And I should have shown that with no veil because there truly would be no veil there. And you're able to go in once the first tabernacle is removed. You go into the second tabernacle or the holiest of holies. And that represents you remove the first covenant so that you can get into the second covenant, which is the new covenant. Praise God. Aren't you glad the veil's been opened when Jesus died on the cross so that we could get into the second new covenant and we're not bound by a ritualistic series of, of ordinances and rituals? We are in the very thing God wanted us to be into. And in Hebrews, going to Hebrews again, chapter 9 actually let's go to chapter 10 now and verse 9 then said he lo i am come to do thy will o god he taketh away the first that he may establish the second he took the first tabernacle away so you could get into the second and that symbolizes taking away the first covenant so you can get into the new covenant when jesus died and that veil was ripped that indicated that the most holy place or the new covenant is now open and it's represented by Jesus' face being unveiled. Hallelujah. And after chapter 9, explain that. Chapter 10 then stated something about the veil again. Watch this. And we're getting into a deeper understanding here when you drop down in chapter 10 to verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, there's the key. Boldness is quite an interesting word that the writer of Hebrews chose to use. With boldness, we go into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. What's he trying to say? By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. And then he tells you what the veil represented. That is to say, his flesh. Remember when Jesus' flesh died on that cross? That's when the veil ripped open. That was God trying to symbolize to us that the ripping of his natural life, the death of his flesh, was like the opening of the veil so that you could get into the holiest and praise God, folks, you could get in there by boldness. He's consecrated this living way. It's a new way and it's a living way because Jesus' flesh, though it died when the veil ripped, and he said, I am the way. He could say, I am the entrance. Didn't he say, I am the door of the sheepfold? The sheepfold is the holiest of holies. The way is into the holiest of holies. And when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus was on earth when he was talking to them. So he said, where I am right now. He was the only one in the kingdom of God. The apostles, the disciples, they weren't even born again yet before the cross when Jesus said this, and they weren't spiritually where he was. 
But he said, I'm going to go away. And he talked about going to the cross, dying, and then going up into heaven. So that where I am right now, that's where, he didn't say where I'm going to be, you will be. He said where I am, you will be. And he went into the holiest of holies, and then that opened up the entire new covenant. My, the Lord's showing me more, and I'm going to have to process what I'm getting now and get into this a little later. But let's go on through this message. So when Jesus died, the veil ripped. That's what the ripping meant. His flesh was being killed. And then after we read verse 20, a new and living way, he's the way. That body that died resurrected. That's why it's a new and living way. It ripped and it died on the cross. But then it resurrected from the dead. And that body, through his death, it's trying to tell us. It's knowledge, remember. All this represents knowledge. Through his death that you understand, you can get into the holiest of holies. My whole message today is trying to get across to us all that we are changed into his image when we receive the light of the knowledge. When you properly learn, and I do want to emphasize that word properly. When you properly learn this, you're going to have a revelation. It's going to hit you. It's going to explode from within your spirit. And when it does, that revelation experience is going to change you. You know what I mean when you get a revelation and it explodes in your heart. You're actually being changed every time that happens. I'm so excited when we minister the word of the Lord, just like what happened here this morning, when God just already started speaking and giving revelations, because I know what the word says. And you're getting revelations. A lot of you are getting them too while I preach, because you're being exposed to the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and it'll ignite your heart to receive revelation. Brad Tucker watches with us, and I remember, Brad, you gave a powerful revelation here a few weeks ago. And, and Alfred McLaren and Daniel Blair, you folks, getting these revelations and, and more of you. Because when we get revelations, we're being changed. And that's why I'm so excited to get revelation from the Word of God. We're being made more into Jesus' image when that, thing, that kind of thing happens. So when you put all these pictures together, the veil ripping, uh, Jesus being the light, he's like the ark behind the veil, that's where God's word comes from, the face of Jesus Christ. You put it all together. When the veil ripped the moment Jesus died on the cross, the veil represents his flesh, and that opens the way into the holiest of holies, you see a powerful truth. God had to remove our sins so that we can be with him and see his glory again. Hallelujah. See, the sacrifice of Jesus is the only way, the only thing that can remove our sins. Not your good works. That's why Jesus is trying to get a message to you that's full of grace. Think of being full of grace, full of the truth that it's not of works, full of the truth that there's not an inch, not a millimeter, not a micromillimeter of opportunity for you to earn your way into glory. His death is the only way that opens up the way into the holiest for us. That's why the veil ripped when he died. Praise God. That's why the veil ripped when he died. Because he's trying to tell us, it's not your going to school. It's not your learning this. And it's not your learning all these activities and works that's going to open up the way for you to go to heaven. It's going to be nothing more and nothing less than his death on the cross. And that's why his death caused the veil to rip open. And that is all a symbolic picture of the kind of knowledge you need to receive. Hallelujah. No man cometh unto the Father but by Jesus, Jesus said, but by me. And that shows us that through his death on the cross, the veil is open and that's where the Father is, inside of that veil. And, and you heard me say the Son, the Son of God is the Word and he's in there too. Well, John saw the Lamb of God go to that throne. And now it's the throne of God and the Lamb. It's the Father and the Son, and it's all one God anyway. Hallelujah, God. So through his death, think of being in that holiest through his death. Now, I told you, and look at the screen again, we've got boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. 
Boldness is so important because the dying of his body caused the unveiling of the most holy place to occur so that we could enter, right? Unveiling means revelation. And that brings us back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, where we read that God, he commanded light to shine out of darkness, shining in our hearts, giving the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Notice it's all talking about his face. His death that opened up that most holy place represents the knowledge that you receive, the revelation that you gain. And when you truly and properly get that kind of revelation, you will be bold. You will get such a boldness because you will be fully convinced that his sacrifice was that perfect. And if you read Hebrews 9, and if you read Hebrews 10, and come up to verse 19, and all the truth that's mentioned before this verse, you're going to read how perfect Jesus' sacrifice was. You're going to read that 1,500 years couldn't impress God to open up the holiest for us. But when Jesus died, that first tabernacle that included the veil was all taken away. God rid himself of it. And all he's got left is an open holiest of holies for us now. And when you understand that his death was that perfect, you get a revelation and you're suddenly filled with boldness. You see, when you think of fellowshipping with God in the most holy place in the universe, I mean, that makes you hesitate. The most holy place in the universe? God wants us to go in there? That will make you hesitate. But when you get a revelation of how perfect the work of the cross was and how perfect and how holy his sacrifice was, then you know it completely makes you ready to go into the holiest. He's trying to get a hint to us when he said in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, you're changed into his image. You are made most holy, not by any works that you do, not by lifting one little finger. Will you be able to enter into that? You can't add anything. And we always think, well, Little finger, I need a mountain of good works. And you know, you'll never be that good and you'll never be able to perform that kind of goodness that it takes to get you in there. So you become aware that Jesus did everything that it takes to get us into the holiest. And that emboldens you. If you're hesitating, if you don't have a boldness to get in and run, we heard a song years ago, mercy came running like the veil had the mercy seat behind it in the Ark of the Covenant. And it, it, it pressed people away from, from God and, and God couldn't relate with people. And when the veil ripped, mercy came running out. Well, it's really the opposite way around. We go running in because we're so full of boldness, angels can't really go where we can go. We become more holy than the angels. And you might say, how's that possible? Well, how many know God's holiness is holier than the angels? So if he gives us his holiness and he gives us his righteousness, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then you are more holy than the angels because you've got God's holiness. Hallelujah. And you go running in there. So if you don't have that boldness, you didn't get the revelation. It didn't hit you. You just read words in a Bible. You just heard words from a preacher. But somebody else that has words that they're reading in a Bible can be reading it in faith and asking God to show them. And boom, it impacts them. It explodes in their hearts. God has actually said, let there be light. And when that person has that kind of experience, they're given boldness. And not only are they given boldness, he says in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance doesn't mean you lack any assurance at all. You've got full, you're fully assured that you are able to go into that holiest. Your heart has been sprinkled from an evil conscience. An evil conscience, let me tell you what an evil conscience is thinking you can do something and you're not good enough because you can't do enough to get into the holiest. You're right. You're not good enough and you can't do enough to get into the holiest. But if that discourages you, you didn't get a revelation 
that you're not supposed to be good enough on your own efforts to get in there. That Jesus changes you into his image. So you know what's happening with us right here now in this service? As I'm preaching, if you're in the spirit and if you focused on the Lord and your heart is torn toward what I'm saying, then your heart is actually turned toward the face of Jesus because that's the knowledge of the glory of God that I'm getting. It's from his face. And you're being changed and God is literally saying, let there be light in that soul. Kathleen Chris, let there be light in you. Brad Tucker, let there be light. Daniel Blair, let there be light. Iris, Corley, everybody is watching this. Some of you folks, let there be light. LaRue Thompson, and we've got many folks watching us. God's saying, let there be light. And it's exploding in your heart. And revelation is actually changing you. And it suddenly gives you boldness. You say, why have I been so stupid <laughs> to be plain? To think that I'm not worthy to go in there. I just received a revelation that I am as holy as he is. I'm being changed into his image. And as I hear this preacher preach, or as I read the Bible teach these things, and you could be hearing it in a gospel song. If there's good gospel songs that are filled with word, then that changes you. And you're more and more in his image. You're being made bold. Praise God. The face of Jesus Christ, the glory is unveiled. And just like from the Ark of the Covenant, his word is going forth and shining on you. Hallelujah, God. And you're grasping it. You're getting it. It's exploding in your soul. So let me emphasize this. If you don't get that kind of experience, you haven't gotten a revelation yet. But you can. If you keep praying, say, God, show me this, show me this. Watch this video over again when it's done. Or read these scriptures. Get that and go slowly through it and, until something starts hitting you. And it excites you. And that is what 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 is trying to say. You are being changed in his image. And that's the same thing 2 Corinthians 4 and 6 is trying to say. That God is saying, let there be light. And the light of the knowledge of glory of God in the face of Jesus is changing you into his image. You begin realizing his perfection, his holiness, and it's considered yours. He's that much in union with you folks that his righteousness and holiness is yours. You need a revelation of your unity and identity to Jesus. You are so perfectly united to him when you get baptized into his name that you have his righteousness. You, we know we've got his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But we also have his holiness and his righteousness. Hallelujah. And when you properly learn that, you will be given such boldness. Why, why were apostles like John and Paul so powerful in their understanding? How are they so bold? Because like John said, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, we beheld his glory. We got the revelation. That glory is the light of the knowledge of the glory. It's knowledge. And he said, we beheld it. We got the revelation. It made us bold as lions. Hallelujah, God. It changed our lives, they'll tell you. The light of God's glory literally shone over that mercy seat. But now it's in the face of Jesus Christ. And you know, in, in Matthew chapter 16, when Peter received a revelation, Jesus said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elias. And he said, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus looked at him and he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it. You got a revelation, Peter. And the Father gave you that revelation. And that is the revelation that the church is built upon. The rock is the revelation of Jesus. We all know that the rock is Jesus. Now, some people think the rock is Peter. And on Peter, the church is going to be built. No, 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 no. Peter himself said, no other foundation can any man lay. Peter himself said that the rock is Jesus. And we are lively stones that are built on him. The living stone, the cornerstone. But 
It's this revelation of Jesus. It's, it's hearing from God, being changed from it, and getting built. Oh, wow, the Lord's showing me this again. Hallelujah. When you get boldness, it's like you're on a rock. No storm can shake you. Storms will attack your mind. It's talking about the mind when Jesus said in Matthew 7, the winds blew and the waves beat upon the house and, and the storm came crashing, but the house stood still because it was on a rock. And he says, if you hear my words and do them, if you believe what I'm saying, my words, and get a revelation, you get boldness. Nothing can shake your boldness. The devil can say, well, look at you. You're not this and you're not that. And you didn't do this and you didn't do that. It doesn't matter what we did or didn't do. It matters what Jesus did and what Jesus did in our lives as a result, changing us into his image. That puts us on a rock so the devil can't cause you to flinch. Hallelujah. And so after Jesus says this, then we go to the next chapter, Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, brings them up into a high mountain. And Jesus is transfigured, and his face shines like the sun. Didn't Paul say in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. Didn't we read in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, Jesus' face is not veiled, it's open. And with open face, we behold his glory. And didn't John say in John 1 and 14, we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. That is all language that's spiritual, saying that we got the revelation. And Jesus was physically showing this by his face physically shining. And that glory that was behind the veil on the ark was, praise God, shining from the face of Jesus Christ temporarily. Praise God, because Jesus was actually going to be glorified when he'd sit on that throne in heaven. And when you go back to Matthew 17 and verse 4, after you read Moses and Elijah appeared, and then Peter starts talking again. Peter was the subject back in chapter 16, getting a revelation. And then Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. But here's where Peter made the mistake. Yes, let Jesus be honored, and let's build a tabernacle. And you said, Jesus, upon this rock I'll build my church. Well, here's a rock. We're on a mountain. Let's build a tabernacle for you, Moses and Elijah. But then, while he was talking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved son. You don't need Moses, Peter. You don't need Elijah. They were only preparation. Moses represented the law that witnessed of Jesus. Elijah represented the prophets that witnessed of Jesus. But this is my son. Listen to him. Hear ye him. Listen to him. Why? Because he's the word. He's the glory. He's the ark. He's where the glory of God communes with people behind the veil. And instead of an ark now, we've got the real thing, the face of Jesus Christ. So listen to him. Let that revelation get inside of you. And then after he's told by the father to listen to the son, when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. And Jesus touched them and said, be not afraid, arise. And then they only saw Jesus after that. Folks, when you hear from God and God gets through to you, listen to him. The law and the prophets fade away and all you see is Jesus. Hallelujah. And look what Jesus says as they came down from the mountain. Jesus charged them saying, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man is risen again from the dead. And there he is talking about the cross, the cross that ripped open the veil, the cross that unveiled the new covenant, the cross that the death of Jesus caused to bring us into the most holy place when nothing else can get us in there. None of our good works, all of the law's ritual piled on top of each other, couldn't get anyone into the holiest of holies for 1,500 years, except one man for one day. And now we can go in all the time, and some people go in one day a week. Go in all the time. Hallelujah. It's resurrection from the dead that caused Jesus to sit on that throne, and that's what the Ark of the Covenant represents, him sitting on the throne up in heaven. 
That's why Jesus was glorified when he died, buried, was resurrected, ascended up into heaven, and sat on that throne. And that's why he, the Word, is in the very location that God said he would commune to Israel with from the mercy seat. Jesus is that Word. That's why Jesus sits there. Hallelujah. And you know what God's showing me also right now? When you let God bless you, you will understand that you're seated together with him. You become full of truth and you become full of grace because you receive this revelation and God can use you, the body of Christ, to speak to somebody else to help them get in there. Listen to Jesus, Peter. Listen to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. You know, Isaiah saw his glory in Isaiah chapter 6. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And the seraphims, like the carabims over the mercy seat, seraphims were over above the throne of Jesus. And they cried, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of what? His glory. His glory. And if the glory is the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus, then the whole earth will be filled with his knowledge. Isn't that another scripture too? Hallelujah. And John described Jesus, the word made flesh. We beheld his glory. He had to die, folks. And in closing, let me just mention another scripture. When leadership and priesthood was in question in Israel and the people thought they could all be priests. Then God spoke to Moses. Here's what you need to do. You need to show that it's from a certain family and a certain tribe this priestly leadership comes from. So take a rod from every one of the 12 tribes of Israel, a wooden staff, a dead stick that represents their tribe, and put every one of those 12 rods in the holiest of holies in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Watch, this is powerful. And leave it overnight. And then the next morning, when Moses went in to get those rods, out of those 12 rods, the rod of Levi, Aaron and Moses' family, was changed by the power that came from this ark into a resurrected living branch of wood. Not dead anymore. It was alive. It was raised from the dead. And not only was it alive, it had buds and flowers and fruit at the same time. And nature can't do that because this is unnatural resurrection life. Hallelujah. And that word from that Ark of the Covenant, so to speak, spoke to that dead stick and said, come alive. And God chose that stick and it came into a living. You see, Jesus sat on that throne after he died, after he was buried, and after he was resurrected. And when the resurrection symbol of Jesus, the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the throne that the risen Christ sat on, was placed before those rods, it changed that dead rod of Levi into a resurrected living branch, just like Jesus said, I am the way, I am the life, I am the truth, and I am resurrected, and changed it into a resurrected existence like Jesus had. And that's what it means to look at his glory as in a mirror or a glass and to be changed in your image, in that image of Jesus. His resurrection becomes ours. It changes us. He resurrected, sat on that throne, which the ark represented. And that's why in front of the ark, a dead stick resurrected, just like Jesus would resurrect. All to show we're changed into his image. His resurrection power comes to us. Hallelujah. And it's all by the word. Oh, let's give glory unto God right now. Let's give him praise. Let's give him thanks. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we give you all the praise. Change us. More resurrected people. We've been resurrected already, Lord, but we don't know it. And folks, the Lord's showing me something else. Thus saith the Lord your God. 
I would give you a word of prophecy, my people, that as my servant Paul the Apostle talked about your baptism into my death, I told you through him that you need to know, know you not? That when you're baptized into me, you're baptized into my death. And when you know that, saith your God, then you reckon that to be true of yourself. You yield yourself as one that is alive from the dead, as I was in the flesh and died and resurrected from the dead. You are changed into my image and you talk and you pray to me as somebody who knows you're resurrected from the dead as well. And that's because my glory and my truth and my light and my knowledge has caused you to know when formerly you did not know that you're changed into my image. You did not understand completely how I give you my righteousness. I give you my holiness. And it gets inside you and it changes you until you're in my image and you are alive from the dead as much as I am. And that is the light of the knowledge that I am giving you my people right now, says your God. Hallelujah, Lord, let's praise him right now and thank him for revelation. Thank him for truth. Thank him for the word. Knowing we, have you learned something? Do you know something now you didn't know before? Hallelujah. Then you have been changed already. And if you know what I'm talking about, you experience what I'm going to describe. You've got boldness now. You are bold. You can go in. You've got full assurance of faith. You're not wavering. You're fully convinced that the death of Jesus Christ was the only way you could come to know the most holy place where God dwells because you have been made most holy. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Aren't you glad that even on vacation, we can share the word of God with you and, and God will bless you so much and, and change you into his image. If you'd like to give and bless our ministry, Here's the information where you can help us with and keep us in prayer. Big things are happening with this ministry. We're excited. Um, you can do e-transfer to sbolchurch at gmail.com or paypal at bloom.breathoflifechurch at gmail.com. And please share this video as well. God wants to show everybody the truth of the cross, to make them alive in Jesus. We all know it's not about us, is it? It's about him and his kingdom and his will being done in this earth. In Jesus Christ's name.